Ah, Happy New Year. I'm being quiet because that, you know, on the off chance that you may have, the science of hangovers isn't really understood very well right now. Uh, we know a number of factors play into it. Um, there's changes in the immune system and glucose metabolism, dehydration, metabolic acidosis, of course, disturbed prostaglandin synthesis, increased cardiac output, vasodilation, sleep deprivation, and malnutrition. Uh, you might have dry mouth, fatigue, dizziness. You might feel like poop. It's a technical term. And uh, this kind of discomfort can last up to 24 hours or more. And I'm just mentioning that just in case, you know, so, good luck with that. Hello and welcome to Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections and address them while sitting at a desk because you've almost seen nobody on the internet's legs. Because no one likes that kind of framing, except the people who always frame themselves up full body on a green screen, and that doesn't look good. You know who I'm talking about. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint. Ooh, who am I now? Nah, not the most famous person in the world. Whoa. But getting right to it, like last week, I was not able to look at and respond to your comments in real time like I usually do for these videos on the Thor's Hammer in Space Movement video. Even in here, in the void, I do get some time off. So for this episode, instead, again, we are going back to all the comments, questions, and corrections that you sent me on all my social media platforms over the years that I haven't been able to quite work into an episode. So consider this more evergreen. Oh, that reminds me, throw out your tree. It's been, it's been, oh, oh, it's, eh, you can throw it out. So what did you have to say? Our first comment comes from Nolan Fast on Facebook, who says, would flight be possible as depicted in the Butterfly Derby Futurama episode? Love the show, by the way. Whoa, keep it up. I have to, contractually. In case you're unaware, the low gravity on the moon is supposed to be why they're able to fly using the wings fixed to their arms. Now, this is a very interesting question, of course. Is there a planet with, or body, that has low enough gravity where you could generate enough thrust with just your arms and some wings to lift you off the ground? And instead of doing the calculations myself, I will defer to the wonderful Randall Monroe of XKCD who kind of already answered this question. If you go to uh, his blog, What If, and the interplanetary Cessna blog post, he was calculating how a Cessna would fly in different atmospheres in the solar system. And when he's talking about Titan, he says, quote, in fact, humans on Titan could fly by muscle power. A human in a hang glider could comfortably take off and cruise around powered by oversized swim flipper boots or even take off by flapping artificial wings. The power requirements here are minimal. It would take no more effort than walking. And it's because the combination of the atmosphere on Titan and the gravity would allow uh, you to flap your wings or butterfly-like wings and take off on Titan. So if Futurama was looking into anything like this for their butterfly derby, then yes, it absolutely would be possible which doesn't really surprise me. There's a lot of very smart people on Futurama, a couple with mathematics PhDs. So yes, it is possible. Our next comment comes from James J. Conlon, fourth of his name, who says, would the typical fantasy dwarves be buoyant or sink like a stone? Okay. Well, whether or not something sinks or floats depends on its density, and we can be that simplistic, usually talking about water, because uh, when you're talking about density, the buoyant force that would suspend something or make it float on the surface of something like water, the buoyant force depends on how much volume of liquid or fluid that you are displacing. What is the weight of that? So for something like a beach ball, the weight of a beach ball is less than the amount of water that the beach ball presses out of the way. Think of how how big a beach ball is. When you press it down under the water, you are pushing a beach ball's worth of water out of the way, and water is very, very heavy. So while the beach ball may weigh less than a pound, you could be trying to press 100 or 200 pounds of water out of the way. So a beach ball floats. Similarly, a large tanker ship, like these super tankers that have uh, millions and millions of gallons of oil, they can float because they're made out of steel, but when you look at the cross section, they're mostly empty space. So when you average all of that material out, you get a density less than water, so it floats. 
All of that is to say that we need some more specific figures for our dwarves. How dense are they? Are they made out of humanish stuff, which is to say kind of watery? Uh, are they wearing a lot of gear? Are they abnormally uh, light like elves are? We would need a little bit more, but if dwarves are just shorter, more compact people, they'd float just as well as you would. Depending on how many axes they carry, and my axe makes me sink. They cut that part. Our next comment comes from Chris Semb, who says, I would like to recommend doing an episode on Fallout's power armor. I would like to know your thoughts on the realism of it, including the ability to jump safely from great heights, allowing the user to be safe. Well, thinking about it, right from the get-go, jumping from a great height would be a problem because no matter how strong the material of the power armor, it can only flex its legs the amount that a human can flex its legs when bending at the knee. So that will dictate how much distance you can come to a stop in given your velocity. Now that could lead, depending on your initial velocity falling from something, that could lead to a very, very high deceleration. So even if your legs don't break and even if the suit doesn't break, your body would still undergo a rapid deceleration that could kill you, which puts some kind of limit on how high you could jump from in power armor, which sounds like a great episode, and you know what? I'm putting it on my list. Chris, I will get to this. Chris says power armor is cool, comma, five million views, easy italics. Our next comment comes from FalconReach21 on Instagram, who says, hey Kyle, sorry to bother you. It's fine. I know you're busy. I was wondering, what argan oil product do you use for your hair? Well, Falcon Reach, you have thankfully triggered another edition of our award-winning series, Maintain. Oh yeah, that's right. Hey fellas, look, I know that you want to try out long hair. I know that it looks cool. I did the same thing. You want to look like a rock star, sure but most of those dudes have stringy, gross, unwashed rock star hair. You don't want that. You want to look, oh, beautiful. You want to maintain. That's why I use one and only argan oil currently. Ooh, all right. Sponsor me so I don't have to buy it. Our next comment comes from K Klozy, who says, hello, this is a shot in the dark, in the void, but fortune favors the bold, yeah, sometimes. Huge fan of the content, but rock climbing uh, is something I'm looking to get into as a sport or a hobby. Any recommendations for a rookie on either shoes or how to learn technique on how to get better at the sport? Thank you. All right, well, as some of you know, I am an avid rock climber. I've been climbing on average every single week of my life since I was 18, so it's been quite a long time without missing a beat, so uh, I consider myself fairly good, better than either Jared Leto or Jason Momoa, and you can tell them that. Uh, but for some starting tips, I would say that if you were looking into a good pair of climbing shoes, they don't matter too much in my experience until you get around the V4, V5 difficulty. And then that's when you want to start upgrading your shoe game. In fact, the only shoe I climb in is the La Sportiva solution. La Sportiva. When you have a problem, get the solution. Sponsor me. But seriously, I, I love hyper-aggressive shoes like this, like the La Sportiva Solution. I've been climbing in it for like a decade. And uh, you can see how downturned they are. And for you non-climbers out there, downturn shoe allows you to put almost all of the force of your entire foot on a very small point. And when you're standing on very small things on the rock wall, you can generate the full force that you want to with your foot without compromising foot position. That's very, very important. Also, this rubber is very, very hard, so it supports your tiny muscles and tendons in your toes so you don't overstress them or overwork them. and also has heels that are very, very strong, and this is neoprene, and it's wonderful. Get a solution, but you probably don't need a solution for that problem by La Sportiva, unless you are doing pretty hard bouldering problems, I'd say five and up, six and up. Now, when you get to the V5, V6 range, that's when you probably wanna start training. Uh, if you're talking about tips, uh, most rock climbing gyms have how to boulder classes or just ask someone who looks like they know what they're doing and ask them for help. They will usually give you beta or advice on how to do stuff, and most people are climbing gyms I've found are very, very nice and friendly. Um, but when push comes to shove, once you start hitting a strength plateau, you really wanna 
start putting strength gains into your workout plan. So it's not just climbing a lot, it's, it's lifting weights and uh, practicing with the intention of getting better, uh, whether that be pull-ups or weighted climbing with a weight vest, something like that, like Goku would do. For example, one of my New Year's resolutions, speaking of New Year's, was to get much, much stronger. Uh, <laughs> It's very basic, but to get more in shape and to be a better version of myself. And once I started adding lifting and a lot more focused uh, workouts to my climbing, I went from climbing V7, V8 to flashing, getting on the first try without even looking at it, flashing V8 and I'm climbing about V10, uh, V11. So it's made a, a huge difference. So I would say get up to your first strength plateau, get a great shoe like the La Sportiva Solution, sponsor me, and then start buffing up. Although you want to stay lean. Not, not, not too lean, but take care of yourself. Our next comment comes from Notorious Timmer, who says, Hey, I was just wondering, what would happen if a portal opened to space on Earth? We don't actually have to imagine anything very sci-fi to know what would happen in this case, a portal opening to space here on Earth. It's the same thing as thinking about what would happen if you poked a hole in a spaceship. And that's the same situation, having one atmosphere of pressure open to a hole that is zero atmospheres of pressure, or very, very close to zero. And we know what happens, and it's not like what you see in the movies. I actually did a video on this. Air around the hole, very close to it, would start flowing out of the hole very, very fast because the pressure differential from one to zero is a big pressure differential. So right at the hole, air would be flowing out in a choked flow scenario. And in that scenario, air is flowing out at the speed of sound in that air, which is very, 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 very fast. But as you move away from wherever the puncture is, that airflow gets slower and slower and slower. Imagine sitting in a giant pool and then pulling the plug on one end at the very bottom of it. You probably wouldn't feel it if you were on the other end of the pool. It's the same thing with air. So if you poke a hole in a spaceship, if you open up a portal to space from Earth, only if you were right near the hole would it be a real problem. Otherwise, it's more of just like a rapid decompression of something, not a catastrophic one like you'll see in Event Horizon or something like that. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to Alex Carl 513 who says, how hard would the Hulk have to punch in order to punch through time? Well, Alex, I mean, we don't even have to really speculate about this. You can do it. So uh, what you want to do is you just kind of want to line up, really visualize what you're going to do. And you're just going to line up, and then you're going to... Happy New Year. Like last week, Alex, 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 Alex. Whoa. Sit, I got this. So for taking us on that wild investigation where we learned many things and saw so many possible futures, you are indeed, Alex, a super nerd. Ah! Time punch. Now, if you are already subscribed to Alpha, which you can do at projectalpha.com, you already know what the next because science is gonna be, because you've already seen it two days earlier than anyone else, and you've seen other premium content from Nerdist, Geek and Sundry, and myself. But if you haven't subscribed to Alpha just yet, and you will want to for all the stuff that we're doing next year, can't tell you about it right now. The next episode of Because Science is, can you break into Superman's house? That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, we are evaluating a very clever and specific concept from all-star Superman. In that comic, Superman keeps his house key under the rug to the Fortress of Solitude, but that's fine because the key actually weighs half a million tons because he says it's made out of dwarf star material. But how much would it actually weigh if it was actually made out of dwarf star material? If it wasn't, what would it have to look like? Could you pick up the key even though he says no one on Earth can do so? Ooh, find out. Ta. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science, all about Thor's hammer in space, and leave me all your nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions, because I still do look at them when I have the time at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. Look, it's right there. And don't forget, if you're gonna be making some New Year's resolutions this year, a lot of people and a lot of different websites and other places are gonna tell you the best ways to keep those resolutions. Uh, and they will be uh, very wide ranging what they say works. But we know a couple things from the psychological research that actually do work. So if you're making a New Year's resolution, you want it to be fairly specific, not I just want to get better, but I want to you know, lose five pounds or what have you. And then you wanna give it a time limit 
You want to say, oh, I want to do that by March or whatever, or by the end of the year. And then you also want to uh, tell people that you are making these resolutions. It kind of is a check and balance on your psychological state. Because when you know you have to be somewhat accountable to another person, it makes you check on yourself, check on your resolutions even more so. And here's one more. No matter what your New Year's resolution is, you got this. <laughs>